um, welcome everyone for yet another talk on different network methods. And um, I felt it will be interesting to you to see a comparison of different um, approaches. There is of course a vast literature on different networks. And um, of course the best comparisons always involve real data and so I will focus on that today. So um, I will talk about several articles, um, some written by our group, some written by other groups. Because especially when it comes to comparisons, it's always best to have people evaluate methods that have um, no bias or preference whatsoever. You know. So um, the first paper I will describe was written by um, my former um, doctoral student, Lin Song. And um, clearly, <laughs> there is a, put a, a risk of bias. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, um, so in any event, it was a comparison of different co-expression measures. Um, the second article um, that I will describe um, was written by a group um, that is not related to us in any way. I wasn't aware of the paper until some people emailed it to me. And then there will be a third topic which I may have to cover after lunch. So let's talk about um, a comparison of different co-expression measures. So um, remember, we encode a um, gene network using an adjacency matrix. And so the adjacency between two genes measures in, in some shape or form their co-expression. And um, remember, in WGCNA, we um, define uh, these adjacencies based on a correlation coefficient and we distinguish two types of correlation networks. The unsigned correlation network based on the absolute value of the correlation and the signed um, network adjacency that keeps track of the sign of the correlation. It distinguishes positive relationships from negative relationships. Now, there have been several papers, um, often written by computer scientists, um, who use a completely different approach for measuring co-expression. And that is based on something called mutual information. Um, mutual information is um, a measure that um, is, uh, takes a central position in something called information theory. Some people may have heard um, Shannon, who, who started it all. And a um, similar term is entropy, it's all related, entropy, mutual information, and so on. And um, this is, of course, um, an optimal measure when you deal with um, digital and discrete information, okay? When you, um, information theory was very much about transmitting digital information. And um, you can then prove that mutual information is an optimal measure. For, uh, that satisfies certain axioms of information theory. Now, um, so given that there are theorems that show that it's an optimal measure, um, it's very tempting to assume, well, then it's also an optimal measure for um, co-expression studies. There's only one little glitch, which is um, gene expression levels are not digital. They are continuous variables, right? It's an abundance measure. And, um, and therefore, um, one needs to arrive at a measure of mutual information for continuous variables by employing certain estimation methods. And there are many different estimation methods of mutual information. Um, one is simply to take your continuous variable and dichotomize uh, uh, dichotomizing it uh, repeatedly into bins. You know, you, let's say you um, partition the range of the variables into 10 bins. And then what you do is you calculate the frequency of occurrence of each bin, and you get a probability from that. And then you can apply this rather complicated formula um, to these frequencies. I'm not going to review what that formula means. If you really want to need to know, um, Google search it. There's Wikipedia has a phenomenal entry on it, you know. 
But what you need to learn from this course is there is this measure, mutual information, that is um, often used in practice. All right. Now, as I said, the estimation of this um, measure is often computationally challenging, and there are different philosophies of how to estimate it in case of numeric variables. But here, I only evaluate this measure when you use this idea I described a second ago of, of um, splitting the data into equal-sized bins. So um, let's review features of correlation and mutual information when it comes to measuring the association of two variables. So um, what correlation is attractive because it requires relatively few observations. As I remember yesterday I showed you a table of sample size calculations and I want to say 20 samples or 30 samples can uh, give you a fairly good and accurate measure of correlation. There are no hidden parameters, right? It's you see a simple formula, and there it is. It's also very easy to calculate asymptotic p-values. You have a student t-test, you have the Fisher z transformation, and so on. Most importantly, you have the sign of the relationship, right? In biology, you very much care to know, is there a positive relationship between this gene expression and the trait? Or is there a negative relationship? And um, the byweight, another advantage is that um, this byweight mid correlation, which I will review in a second, is fairly robust to outliers. Um, so we, of course, like correlation. Um, but as I said, there's a substantial um, literature on mutual information based networks. And um, one of the main advantages that is cited by the authors is, well, it detects nonlinear relationships. You know. Now, as I mentioned to you, correlation uh, um, measures can certainly detect monotonic relationship. You know. <laughs> it's not just linear. For example, the Spearman correlation is a perfect measure for detecting monotonic relationships. But in any event, um, it is true that mutual information captures nonlinear relationships and, and um, general um, dependence relationships. So it's an clearly an attractive measure. Um, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, we have found that the by weight mid correlation, which was proposed in the 1970s, is um, an attractive measure, and I will show you data in a second. Um, so. Um, the research questions that I try to address in this talk are whether correlation or mutual information are better when it comes to measuring gene-gene relationships, on the one hand, and on the other hand, we want to know, well, which measure leads to biologically more meaningful modules. Remember, one of the main goals of um, WGCNA and, in general, many systems biologic methods is to find modules. And well, how do you judge whether one module is better than another? Uh, we could have a long debate about it, but let's just be simple-minded and just say we take go enrichment. You know, um, which module, uh, which modules um, um, are enriched for go terms that are more significant? All right. And the other research question we wanted to uh, want to address in this talk is. Um, whether there are alternative methods for measuring nonlinear relationships. Remember, mutual information can measure nonlinear relationships, but people who have taken um, some statistics classes may be aware of so called polynomial and spline regression models, which are also used for detecting nonlinear relationships. So we evaluate those. So, um, before we go there, let me um, review a little bit more about mutual information. So the mutual information measure is, um, depending on how you estimate it, let's assume it's a non-negative number, but it is certainly a number that can be larger than one. It could be a n um, it's actually bounded by the entropy of the variables. Um, and so in order to define a mutual information-based adjacency measure, we need to divide the mutual information by the maximum um, possible value. And, and that it just turns out that the entropy of 
the f first gene or the entropy of the second gene, um, if you take the maximum of these two measures, that is actually the upper bound of the mu mutual information. And I already mentioned to you there are many other upper bounds, and each of these upper bounds would give rise to a different adjacency matrix. And uh, in, in, um, in the book on weighted network analysis, I review different ways of constructing an adjacency matrix. But um, this measure that I pr um, use here, which we call AUV2, um, is, works as good as all the others. It's in certain ways um, often indistinguishable from other ways of constructing a network. Um, so AUV2 refers to a mutual information-based adjacency, um, which we call universal version 2, because it satisfies certain properties um, referring, uh, referred to as universal distance. Um, um, all right, so let's, um, never mind all the math, let's just apply these measures to detect gene pairwise relationships. And um, to provide a comprehensive um, evaluation, um, Lin Song evaluated eight different data sets coming from brain cancer, 55 observation, um, healthy whole blood samples from San Antonio, um, a thousand subject, neurologic disease, this is all, bl um, these are blood samples, yeast um, co-expression networks, and uh, different mouse tissues, again from Jake Lucis's lab. And so what can you do? Remember we have eight different data sets, and so you can get eight different scatter plots where the y-axis always shows the adjacency based on the mutual information, and the x-axis shows the absolute value of the by-weight mid-correlation. Okay. Now remember that this um, second data set, the SAFHS data, contained a thousand subjects. What does it tell us? You have a sufficient sample size to estimate these dependence measures. And isn't that interesting? When you do that, there's actually a very close relationship between the mutual information on the y-axis and the absolute value of the correlation. That's an interesting finding. I mean, there's a curvilinear relationship, but it's a monotonic relationship. And so if you just use adjacency to rank order pairings, right, this is the most highly connected, this is the least connected, it tells you already that these two measures and this large data set, they give you very similar rankings. And what does that mean? It means that um, highly nonlinear relationships are rare when it comes to gene pairings, right? Because if, we've, um, if mutual information detects these general dependence patterns that are missed by the correlation, you know, there would be a very different graph. Um, similar, we see sim uh, similar curves for the other data sets that involve large sample sizes. And so, if you are a little math nerd, you can try to develop a formula for predicting this curve. And guess who is a math nerd, you know? So <laughs> I developed a formula for predicting this, you know? And uh, I won't torture you with that, but there is a formula. This red curve comes from somewhere. There's really, if you want to, if you, it is a sick question to ask, predict mutual information based on correlation, you know, but it, this formula exists and it is highly accurate. It depends on the sample size, you know, but it works. In any event, now coming back to reality, <laughs> we, um, so what's interesting, there are some data sets involving few samples where you sometimes observe a pair of a gene pair where uh, that has a very high mutual information, like a mutual inform uh, information close to one, meaning close to its maximum value, right? But the by-weight mid-correlation is small. So arguably, this is a gene pairing that really is missed by the by-weight mid-correlation. On the other hand, so these are blue dots. So you note, if you carefully look, there are blue dots in each of the graphs. And these blue dots were not chosen by cherry picking. They were chosen by ranking them, uh, 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 certain um, them according to their difference between these two measures. 
Also, if you carefully look at the graph, there are some dots that are colored in red. And these are dots where we observe a high, a relatively high by weight mid correlation, but the mutual information is low, you know. And so, so what can one do? Well, one can plot these pairings, right? So let's start with the blue dots. So here I give you uh, um, several scatter plots where the x and y axis correspond now to two genes. And for example, um, here we observed a high um, mutual information, but a low correlation. And let's look at this scatter plot. Just forget all the stats. Do you think there's a relationship between these two genes in panel A? You hopefully know not really, you know. This relationship is driven by a single outlier. There is one array in this brain cancer set that leads to a strong dependence, but of course that's non-robust. Now, the by-weight mid-correlation, because it's a robustified measure of the correlation, actually doesn't detect this as a significant relationship, you know. It discards this outlier, and therefore it says there is no relationship between these two genes. Let's look at another example. So here, this is a more interesting example. So here are two genes that clearly have a strong dependence relationship. Why? Because you see some patterns, you know. But uh, um, in, in contrast, the by-weight mid-correlation do doesn't really detect it. I mean, it has a moderate value, but the by-core value, if you carefully look, is 0.33. It's a relatively weak relationship. And um, so in any event, coming back to biologic intuition, do you think this is a dependence relationship that you want to measure as a co-expression relationship in your network? I have a lot of debates about it, you know. <laughs> I, I have no strong opinion, you know. But it is, let's just say it looks a bit unorthodox, you know. Another um, unorthodox relationship is depicted in this panel at the bottom, the third panel, that looks like a cross. Do you see that? Now, um, again, well, is, th does, is that a biologically meaningful relationship between two genes? Maybe it is. Maybe it's a super interesting gene regulatory relationship, but maybe it's just some bizarre artifact, you know. And so there are other kinds of dependence patterns. Again, we didn't cherry pick them. They were based on rankings, you know. Now let's, r um, okay, so here's my uh, overall interpretation, and this is where my bias comes in. I, <laughs> I think some of these dependence patterns are suspicious, and I would rather not have them, you know. Um, all right, now let's reverse things. And here are gene pairings um, that were implicated um, according to the by weight mid correlation. It finds them, but mutual information ranked them relatively lowly. The mutual information kind of missed them. There are some clear things where you say, where you don't really understand why by weight mid correlation, um, perf um, why mutual information failed, you know. For example, here, I mean, just look at these two genes. Um, there seems to be a, um, a linear relationship even, and somehow, um, and so a, a biologist would say, yes, there's a relationship between these two genes, but somehow it was missed. And uh, my suspicion is that it is because when we discretized the bins, you know, when we chose bins, something went wrong, you know. <laughs> Um, there are other such linear relationships, and of course the bicore um, measure is an ideal measure for, um, for measuring linear relationships. And so they all make, in my opinion, more or less biologic sense, you know, but they are missed by the um, mutual information. Yes? Do you think this information picked up non-coexisting compared to this Like if you have two genes that are... Yes, are yes. Yes, so that's a good question. So the question was, does mutual I information um, detect non-coexistence? Absolutely. So that's a great, um, uh, that's a major att attraction about mutual information. It can pick up uh, these so general dependence measures. So yeah. wouldn't pick that up, right? I think it, no, I think it would detect it as a negative relationship. So, yeah, I think it's, 
it takes a little bit of effort to find dependence relationships that can only be detected with mutual information but not with by weight mit, uh, the by weight mid correlation no doubt one can construct it you know but it takes a bit of effort <laughs> most things that you draw down on a sheet of paper somehow s still do have a remnant of a linear relationship in them and you know all right so anyway I do want to emphasize again that these are eight different applications, you know, and so here you go. So let's come now to the second question, which is, um, can we identify biologically meaningful modules? And um, I'll spare you the mini review of WGCNA, but I will say <laughs> that um, there's in step three, we always relate modules to gene ontology information. It's a critical step hopefully of most module-based analyses, you want to know is there go ontology enrichment. And remember, um, in WGCNA, we often use this topologic overlap measure, which originally came from protein-protein uh, interaction networks, but then we applied it to um, co-expression networks and correlation networks. And the truth is one needs to justify it. Why do we use it? Um, before I get there, let me mention that when you compare different networks, you really need to um, make sure that each network, um, that each um, module detection algorithm, that the, that the module detection algorithms are the same except for the input, which the input is of course the dissimilarity based on the co-expression measure, right? But um, we used um, the dynamic um, hybrid approach for finding modules um, for each of these different um, co-expression measures, right? So we applied um, the dynamic hybrid approach to um, correlation networks and to mutual information networks. Um, why? Because we don't want to compare different clustering procedures. We keep the clustering procedure the same we want to compare different co-expression measures. So that's what changes. All right, and so um, let's say we have cor a correlation network-based hierarchical tree or a mutual information-based hierarchical tree. We do branch cutting using identical settings. We get modules, and then what we do is for each module, we identify the five go terms that were most significant. We didn't look at them in any shape or form except based on the p-value. And then we averaged them, you know. Why? Because this was not a biologic study. It was more a, <laughs> and comp uh, hopefully, a I mean, uh, we wanted it to be completely unbiased. And here is are the results. So each panel reports the finding for one of the eight data sets the y-axis shows the minus log of these hypergeometric enrichment p-values and the different bars correspond to different um, co-expression measures. So um, if you look at it, you see that the third bar often takes a high value and it, the bar is labeled by TOM, which is topologic overlap ma matrix. But I should also emphasize this was the topologic overlap matrix transformation of the signed correlation adjacency. Remember, we have unsigned and signed, and it, um, we find which, um, that the signed is often better. So, all right. So, yes? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the question was, what do we report her here? So we take each of, the, um, we have these five um, p-values uh, corresponding to go terms. We uh, take minus log of that and form the average. You know. I mean, the good news is, um, note, uh, look at the axis. So here, for example, the value is eight you know, for on the y-axis. So what does it tell us? I mean, often these modules, on average are highly significantly enriched, which is why people like co-expression measures. They often find biologically meaningful modules. And, um, and I mean, the, the other message is all, me um, 
all networks uh, lead to highly significant results, you know. But so we're talking here about degrees, you know. <laughs> but the truth is, the topologic overlap measure often leads to b more significant go enrichment. And um, now one potential bias is um, one second, please. One potential bias is that, that you could say, well, maybe this module, um, sorry, this measure leads to larger modules. Right, um, because go, um, the go enrichment p values very much depend on the underlying sample size, and so in the paper we we looked at that and we put things on the same footing, and it's not um, a module size effect. It really isn't, you know. Um, there was a question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering. Yeah. As opposed to the adjacency. Uh, yeah. Right, because yeah. um, if you're not doing the topological overlap of a transformation on mutual information, then how do you know? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, how do you know whether Tom is working better than ADV two or whether yeah. ADV two can be improved by? Yes. So um, so one question is um, whether it's really the topologic overlap transformation that makes all the difference. And um, before I an give you a more detailed answer, let me just um, mention the following. The first two bars in these bar plots correspond to just using the adjacency matrix. And the first bar is that of an unsigned weighted correlation network. The second this based on a signed WGCNA. And the third is TOM transformation of the signed one. You know, And um, if you just compare the th three the first three bars in each plot, you do notice um, several things. Um, actually, in these applications, when it comes to go enrichment, signed versus unsigned doesn't make that much of a difference, you know, which um, is a good news because um, most of our papers <laughs> in the past were based on unsigned. So um, there are sometimes differences, and I think I, there are some citations I could show you where only the signed network found uh, significant results. So as a rule, I always recommend the signed network. But coming back to your question, there is a big improvement between just using the signed adjacency versus TOM. You know, TOM really makes things better. And so in hindsight, this is a wonderful empirical validation of the TOM transformation. Can I just follow up real yes. quick? Like yeah. uh, yes. Quick. Yeah. Tom is that much of an improvement and Tom on top of mutual information yes. could also be an improvement? Yeah, I, th I want to, so then the logical question is should you apply Tom to the mutual information measure? And um, I, I want to say we did that, um, but the truth is I don't completely, I, I, I don't think it made a big difference, you know, um, otherwise we would have reported it. But having said this, I urge you to try it out. You know, <laughs> um, we wanted to compare this method to what um, other authors typically use. You know, um, which they don't use topologic overlap on mutual information. Um, but I, um, but let me um, give you some more details because another criticism here is that. Um, I used this AUV2 measure for mutual information in the previous plot. And um, of course, there are um, wonderful mutual information-based methods published in the literature that are much more sophisticated. So if there's um, a, a, um, one approach, Arachne, um, which I will cite shortly. And there are other approaches, CLR, MRNet, RELnet. These are all approaches that are widely known by in the community. There are different ways of transforming mutual information, thresholding it, um, often quite sophisticated approaches. But um, we can just ask, well, if we use them and simply use them for module detection and then again go enrichment, do any of them perform better? And um, the rightmost bar in each plot corresponds again to the topologic overlap measure. And look, I mean, the top TOM based on a signed correlation network gives the best p-values in five out of the eight comparisons. It's pretty good, you know. The second best method is Arachne. Now, uh, Arachne actually has a threshold parameter, you know, and um, there it is. 
I also want to tell you that we didn't cherry pick the threshold for topologic overlap uh, for the TOM measure. Remember, when you have a, a signed WGCNA, there's a beta parameter, and we just used the default value. So, um, so anyway, this tells me that when go enrichment matters, um, use signed WGCNA with a TOM measure. Now, um, there's another um, um, phenomenal measure of dependence that was recently published in Science Magazine in 2011 by Reshef et al. And, um, and this is um, a measure that in some shape or form uses mutual information, but it's, um, it does something more sophisticated. And this measure is called maximum information coefficient. And you may have heard um, terms like the mind statistic, you know. And so um, we felt it, um, it is a valuable comparison to evaluate that measure because um, it avoids a lot of the pitfalls of mutual information. Um, it, it, its estimation is um, um, arguably superior and so on. And um, so what do we find? Um, when we used this, um, this MIC measure, it really performs um, not as well as Tom. In six out of seven comparisons, Tom beat it, you know. And uh, that's a little bit of a surprise because people who uh, like math and theory, they would have uh, um, really hoped that this measure is superior. But there is something called reality, you know. <laughs> and the reality is um, gene expression data are very noisy. And if you have a very sophisticated measure, it can overfit the data. Things can go wrong, you know. And there it is. Now, you notice there was one comparison that we couldn't do. And now you could say, well, this was the one comparison where um, the um, MIC outperformed Tom, you know. <laughs> but the truth is much more prosaic. Um, this was um, this, eighth, uh, this one data set that involved over a thousand arrays. And actually, um, estimating um, this MIC coefficient is computationally intensive. And we, so it, it would have taken several days or so, and, and we just couldn't do it on this data set, you know. Whereas, again, bicore takes about, what, three seconds, you know, so that's something to remember. However, the topologic overlap measure does take computational time. And therefore, we often, of course, use this blockwise module detection approach, you know. All right, as I mentioned, um, if you do want to measure nonlinear relationships in your data because you feel in your application that's critical, you can use um, alternatives to mutual information, which are based on polynomial and spline regression models. So I give you here a mini introduction. Um, in statistics, you often regress one variable, um, for example, y, on a, a dependent variable using polynomials. And it's a linear model, and from that fit, you get an R-square measure, Now, which measures, again, model fit, right? How well does my polynomial regression model fit uh, this pairwise relationship? And um, now this R-square measure is non-symmetrical in the role of x and y, right? Because y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable. And so if you want to construct an adjacency measure, which is um, symmetrical in undirected networks, then you need to symmetrize this R-square measure. Alternatives to polynomial regression include spline regression. Most people nowadays would prefer spline regression over polynomial regression. And so um, it, it, then you can derive a, an adjacency matrix using spline regression in an, an analogous fashion. So what are the pros of these methods? Well, um, these model-based indices, the R-square measure from a polynomial regression model, is uh, again calculated in a straightforward manner. Standard statistical tests are available. You can use f-statistics, chi-squared statistics, and so on to evaluate the, the significance of the relationship. And another major advantage is that um, it's straightforward to include covariates, right? Imagine I have here gene Y and gene X, but I want to include age and gender. That's trivial using a, um, a spline regression model or 
and so or polynomial regression model. So these are compelling advantages of using a model-based index. Um, the one con I can think of is that um, these regression models are not completely general. I bet you can come up with some strange dependence that can only be detected by mutual information but not by um, the polynomial or spline regression model. And so that's a one con. All right, now um, coming to our software code in the WGCNA library. So remember, we have an R function called adjacency, and it allows you to input these gene expression data. And then you to calculate a signed network, you use network uh, this type signed. And then you could say the correlation function should be by weight mid correlation. You do that by saying by core. And also, this, this argument, core function equal, is actually um, an argument in many of our R functions. For example, for calculating the scale-free fitting index or picking a soft threshold or for blockwise module detection. So um, you can always specify by core. And um, based on our empirical studies, we've, we recommend it. You know, so. um, now, some of you do methodologic research, and I want to mention there's another um, command called adjacency from similarity. Guess what it does? Any similarity measure that you can think of, which is a symmetric matrix, not necessarily with entries between 0 and 1, just any symmetric matrix can be turned into an adjacency measure using this uh, um, function. This is not rocket science, but I <laughs> just give it to you. Um, another R function is called adjacency.poly regression. So if you do want to use polynomial regression for finding nonlinear relationships, here's an R function. I do want to say it does take a little bit of time if you have a large matrix. Why? Because for each pairing, it has to calculate a polynomial regression fit. Um, um, analogously, there's an R function called adjacency based on spline regression, so um, that does the same thing. Um, we also included a couple of functions for estimating mutual information, and we did that for no other reason than for reader friendliness, but, uh, but I mentioned there are very good R packages for estimating mutual information. So our command is called mutual info adjacency. Um, all right, the another function um, that is for the math nerds, that remember how I mentioned that I have a function that predicts mutual information based on a correlation matrix, and here it is. So AF, meaning adjacency function for um, tr turning a correlation into a mutual information. Um, there's a vast literature on mutual information. Um, I briefly mention it in chapter 14 of the Weighted Network Analysis book. But um, there are also R packages um, developed by uh, Dr. Strimmer's lab. Um, there's the um, MinNet R package um, developed by Patrick Meyer. And there are um, also um, old articles that um, com evaluate mutual information. Um, okay, so here um, Peter um, developed the bicore R function, Peter Langfelder, uh, that um, calculates a by weight mid uh, correlation in a fast manner. So I, I mention it. So in conclusion, by weight mid correlation outperforms mutual information when it comes to gene pairwise relationships and when it comes to identifying co expression modules. Um, if you want to detect nonlinear dependencies, also consider using polynomial and spline regression. Um, what time do I have? Okay. Um, maybe give me two more minutes. <laughs> so uh, remember how I mentioned that there was another group that uh, compared different um, network construction methods. Um, now this group, um, um, wh whose first author is Alan et al. Um, they have no relationships to our group. I really, um, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know them. I hope to meet them one day. But um, they compared um, different um, uh, network construction methods. 
um, both in simulations and in real um, applications involving E. coli data. And they um, compared um, a, um, a software called GNET by Strimmer's lab. And there's another approach called SPACE based on sparse partial correlation estimation. So why is that an interesting comparison? Because um, people routinely ask me, so why do you use uh, the correlation measure? Why don't you use a partial correlation measure? Remember, partial correlations condition out effects. And so arguably, they enhance the statistical power for detecting um, pairwise associations. And, um, and that is particularly relevant when you study gene regulatory relationships. You know, you want to um, omit a spurious association that involve, that just are based on intermediaries. And so GeneNet and SPACE, these are powerful uh, and user-friendly tools for evaluating partial correlations. So here are the references, um, GeneNet. Arachne is, of course, another um, uh, widely used algorithm that um, uh, um, aims to um, identify direct relationships. Um, so in any event, so the authors evaluated the area under the ROC curve for detecting gene regulatory networks in one simulation study. And here each line corresponds to a different method. And um, what do we see? Well, the one approach that doesn't perform as well when it comes to small sample sizes is this space algorithm. Um, Arachne actually also doesn't perform that well when you have a small sample size, right? Fewer than 100 samples or so. I mean, once you have a large sample size of, let's say, 500, all algorithms perform equally well. But um, allow me to mention WGCNA, which are these green crosses, performs consistently well, you know? So although, although WGCNA was developed for a module-based analysis, if you do care about gene regulatory relationships, it still works quite well in this simulation. Um, here is an, um, another simulation by the authors that involved non-linear, uh, so non-normal distributions of these variables. And what do we see? Again, WGCNA performs as good as all the other methods. These are the um, green crosses, you know. So again, that was, to be honest, it was a surprise. I wouldn't have expected it, but it still works well. And of course, never trust simulations. So here the authors um, now um, evaluated these methods in um, E. coli uh, to study gene regulatory networks. And um, what do we see? Well, again, um, WGCNA works well, you know, even in practice. So um, there you have it. So with this, I stop. And um, do you have any questions? Or, uh, yes. It comes after. So the question is, um, remember I have R commands for um, specifying the adjacency matrix. And um, um, nowhere there do you specify topologic overlap. The topologic overlap is calculated with a separate function called either TOM similarity <coughs> or DIS-TOM, uh, which <coughs> turns any adjacency matrix into a topological overlap matrix. So uh, following up on your earlier questions, what if you um, use a mutual information-based adjacency matrix, for example, based on Arachne, and then transform it using topological overlap? And you would uh, then use this term to accomplish that. So the analysis is straightforward. You know. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. All right, with that, we end this uh, session. And I think we are ready for receiving our graduation cer uh, 